Hello, and welcome to Beyond Japan, an interdisciplinary podcast that looks at the broad reach of Japanese studies from within and beyond Japan. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Japanese Studies at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. I'm your host, Olive Moxon, Research Project Coordinator at the Sainsbury Institute and Researcher of Japanese War Heritage. This week we are joined by Dr. Forum Mitani, British Academy Postdoctoral Fellow at the School of Modern Languages at Cardiff University, to discuss her research on the role of nostalgia in shaping expectations of motherhood. I ask Forum about the seductive discourse of nostalgia, its popular manifestations in Japan today, and how this has led to romantic yet unfeasible notions of how mothers should be based on a fictional notion of the past. Forum also relates her own experience of preparing to be a mother in Japan, and how these expectations appeared in medical guidance as well as popular culture. We hope you enjoy the show. Good morning, Forum. Thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Good morning, and nice to meet you, and lovely to be joining the podcast. So first of all, we'd like to know a bit more about you. Can you tell us about your area of expertise and how your interests have brought you there? Absolutely. So I recently joined Cardiff University's School of Modern Languages as a British Academy funded postdoctoral research fellow. And I'm undertaking a project on representations of motherhood in Japanese culture. And this is the first major project after completing my PhD in Japanese studies at SOAS in 2019. And for that project, I looked at representations of single mothers in contemporary Japanese television drama. However, my interest in Japanese culture and media goes way back and began during my undergraduate studies at Leeds University, which is quite a, quite a long time ago. And that involved a year in Japan where I first began consuming Japanese media and literature in order to improve my Japanese language skills. And after graduation, I returned to Japan on a Japanese government scholarship, a MEXT scholarship, to undertake postgraduate study at Sofia University in Tokyo, where I researched literature and film history. And around this time, I also, in my personal life, had a few um, events happen. I got married and I took a break from my studies to have a family. But becoming a mother in Japan actually was a turning point in my academic career as well as my personal life and had a significant influence and would go on to have a significant influence on my subsequent research on cultural representations of motherhood in Japan. During my pregnancy and after childbirth, I attended various classes for expectant and new mothers. I interacted with many mothers and consumed a lot of media related to motherhood and child rearing. And I was receiving a massive amount of information about what it means to be a mother and what motherhood entails. Um, Basically, that it was like a full time job or vocation. And I began to realize that certain myths about motherhood had become ingrained in society. I mean, not just in Japan, but elsewhere, too. But that there was also this often a gap between these myths concerning ideal motherhood and the reality of motherhood in everyday life, or at least the way I and other mothers I knew were experiencing it. And around this time in Japan, the media also covered several cases of mothers who committed violent crimes or were appearing in public to apologize for crimes committed by their children. And what interested me was that whilst much of the coverage and public opinion was extremely negative towards these women, there were also voices of sympathy. So it became clear to me that many mothers were struggling with the dissonance between reality and the glorified image of motherhood that has been perpetuated. And of course, as I said, this is no, not unique to Japan. It's a global phenomenon. And I realized that media and culture obviously play a significant role in reflecting and shaping discourses of motherhood and that mother, the mother is a powerful symbol in Japanese society. Um, but there a, was a gap in terms of the scholarship in this area, particularly in terms of contemporary discourses. And that's what brought me back to academia and my current research. I see. It's fascinating to hear the personal side of that story of being a mother in Japan. It's not something that often gets through to the uh, academic articles. No, and I think definitely when I was a PhD student, I remember being told in the early days to try and be more objective and not bring too much of the personal into it. But I think, you know, obviously, um, you know, our research is very personal to us, every researcher. So I think... Although you don't want to make it all about yourself and your experience, 
certainly I think it, it it's it's worth acknowledging what motivates us to do what we do. Yeah, exactly. So to begin with, let's define nostalgia. In your 2019 article, Deconstructing Nostalgic Myths of the Mother in Japanese Drama Woman, you refer to the, quote, reinterpretive power of nostalgia, which reveals more about present conditions than past realities, end quote. This is something I think many of us have experienced firsthand through the dramatic politics of recent years. But could you unpack that quote for us? Fundamentally, if we look at nostalgia, you know, just to define the term, it, it refers basically to a sentimental longing or wistful affection for a period in the past. And a longing for the past suggests dissatisfaction with the present circumstances and a sense of having lost something. To feel nostalgic for the past, one has to accept that it has already gone and we are now in a different time. Um, and indeed, the late Svetlana Boim, who wrote you know, quite widely about um, nostalgia. Um, she likened reflective nostalgia to the experience of mourning. However, whenever we look back at the past, we are inevitably invoking or perhaps creating myths of how things used to be. And to draw on baths, for example, in doing so, we have a tendency to smooth over the complexity of human acts. The purpose of this interpretation or reinterpretation of the past is to serve a need we have in the present for comfort or for solace, et cetera. And thus it's often more reflective of our current circumstances, our anxieties and, and our desires. And so the term nostalgia was coined in the 17th century and really it's really boomed during the modern age. You could say that nostalgia and modernity are two sides of the same coin or to use Boehm's analogy, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, however, Boehm was careful to distinguish between modernity and modernization, saying that the former does not fully embrace the latter, but rather is a critique of it. So she saw nostalgia as a longing for another rhythm of time, a slower pace that would enable a critical perspective of modernization, which is often missing in our fast moving society. And Katsuyuki Hidaka in Japan has made similar observations on in his work on Showa nostalgia. So Showa refers to the Showa period, which is 1926 to 1989. So that's a wide spanning and important period of the 20th century. And Hidaka's work focuses specifically on the post-war, the mid-late Showa era, I think. And he argues that nostalgic representations are not necessarily sweet reminiscences, but also offer criticism of the past, specifically the changes that Japanese society experienced during the period of rapid economic growth through the 1960s, and what was lost during this period of change, and how this affected those that were perhaps left behind by modernization. Boehm also saw Nostalgia is a useful lens for criticising capitalism, and as I discussed in my article, the Japanese drama Woman also contains critique, critique of capitalism in contemporary Japan, although it, it's not set in the Showa period. And as Fred Davis noted, expressions of collective nostalgia are often linked to traumatic events or phenomena such as war, economic depression and natural disasters, as people yearn for a glorified past in times of hardship. We saw this happen following the Tohoku triple disaster in 2011, when images and representations of Furusato were invoked to offer comfort at a time when nature had suffered tremendous damage, homes were lost and families were irretrievably fractured. And I see the drama Woman, which, um, was, which aired on, in 2013, as part of this expression of collective nostalgia following the disaster. It's interesting to, to hear nostalgia as being critical of the past. It's often linked to having a fond memory of uh, the past. Uh, the Japanese translation is often natsukashi, which is almost always given as like a, a warm, comforting feeling. So it's interesting how it's developed in that way. So before diving into ideas of motherhood, I'd like to go over with you some of the key themes of nostalgia in post-war Japan. I believe anyone familiar with Studio Ghibli films with their many homely scenes of remote wooden houses and cozy villages will have experienced the romantic idea of furusato, that of the traditional countryside home. Could we start there? 
Yes, absolutely. So Furisato literally means old village and is a term denoting one's ancestral or native home. And it invariably conjures images of communal living in a rural landscape. And it's intimately tied to expressions of nostalgia in Japan. And Furusato has rich cultural significance. It is invoked in a wide array of Japanese literature, film, music, and media. It is used in tourism and advertising to sell places, experiences, and products. Furusato is ubiquitous in Japanese society and culture, I'd say. And I mean, I wouldn't be able to sort of, you know, do it justice here. But for example, you know, there is a traditional song called Furusato, which it's more than 100 years old now, um, but it's still sung. It's still learned and sung by Japanese children in elementary schools today. And the song describes reminiscences of a pastoral childhood spent chasing rabbits and fishing in rivers in a place with green mountains and clear water. And um, Furusato is also, you know, um, found in popular culture. For example, the group Morning Musume recorded a song called Furusato. And the lyrics describe a woman, a young woman who has her heart broken in Tokyo and returns to her hometown to be consoled by her mother. Um, so as with other expressions of nostalgia, Furusato is often evoked during times of difficulty. And as I observe in my article, the mother is often at the center of these nostalgic imaginings of Furusato. And both are associated with love, warmth, nurturance, and a sense of belonging. And they're seen as sanctuaries of re retreat from the rigors of urban life. Yeah, that's fascinating. So I can see how a nostalgic idea of the mother would fit into this conservative notion of the countryside home. You reference a 2013 TV drama called Woman, which you say portrays both a nostalgic fantasy of how mothers used to be, but also then deconstructs this by portraying the reality of women who refuse to conform to this maternal fantasy. Could you summarise the nostalgic fantasy of motherhood and then compare that with the reality? Well, the fantasy of motherhood that is often central to these romantic visions of Furusato is rooted in the notion of amaya, which has been variously defined as codependence or indulgent dependence and derives from the verb amayaru, which means to depend or presume on another's benevolence. Doi Takeo, whose work during the 1960s and 70s in this area was enormously influential, he argued that Maya was vital for healthy infant development because it was the basis of establishing the mother and child bond. And only by indulging the child's every need would the child feel secure and grow up to be a healthy adult. And this theory, combined with Western research on maternal deprivation from the 1950s onwards, justified and reinforced Japanese rearing practices such as prolonged breastfeeding, co-sleeping, co-bathing, um, which are very common in Japan even today. And as the Japanese economy was accelerating in growth, more men were able to support their family on one wage, which allowed wives to stay at home and devote themselves to full-time mothering during this era. In the 1980s, Yamamura Yoshiaki, he was a pediatric specialist, but he wrote a lot about um, family and parenting. And um, he spoke of six images of motherhood that combined to paint a picture of a selfless, devoted mother who is willing to forgive her child's every failing and make any sacrifice necessary for the sake of her child. She endures her suffering because her child is her reason for living. She serves as the child's motivation to work hard so that her sacrifice is worthwhile and also represents the guilt child's guilty conscience when they are when they act selfishly. Um, in the 1990s, Asai Michiko, um, who's a feminist, argued that the post-war institution of the Japanese family had been founded on a maternal fantasy of a woman that is pure, selfless, and asexual, someone who is denied an identity of her own as soon as she marries, um, becoming a mother first to her husband and then her children. And she argued that these myths of motherhood and family had become incorporated into modernity to the extent that it had become so self-evident that it was invisible. They are simply taken for granted. 
um, and to return to Bath's proof, um, in moving from history to nature, myth acts economically. It abolishes the complexity of human acts and gives them the simplicity of essences. Thus, maternal love and devotion came to be seen as a deep-rooted phenomenon of nature or culture, a vestige of prehistoric times that became linked to this romanticized view of the past and, of course, the Furusato as well. And both Furusato and this romantic vision of motherhood were seen as victims of modernization. But the paradox is that rather than being displaced by modernity, nostalgic visions of the Furusato and motherhood are actually inventions of modernity. Neither could have existed without Japan's transition from a rural agrarian society to a modern urban wealthy nation. And both Yamamura and Asai were critical of the selfless mother discourse, although for different reasons, and certainly Yamamura in particular, he, I think now he would be seen quite controversially. Um, but um, they both argued that the glorified image or fantasy of motherhood should be dismantled. Um, of course, by the you know, 1980s and 1990s, the institutions of motherhood and family were already being challenged. The women's lib movement made great strides during the 70s and 80s in, in raising awareness of gender inequality. And some progress was made in improving access for women to educational and employment opportunities. However, despite sort of we have these discourses now of ikumen, which is men participating in childcare and policies that are meant to enable women to return to work after childbirth, women continue to bear the brunt of child rearing. And the problem of balancing family life and a fulfilling career has never been solved really in Japan and maybe not even in other, you know, elsewhere too. Um, so women are still having to make choices and sacrifices. And the difficult socioeconomic conditions and the liberalization of the labor market from the 1990s onwards also had an impact um, as the security of lifetime employment and the ability to raise a family on one salary um, is no longer guaranteed. So more than half of women now continue to work after having their first child, and many women are choosing to delay or opt out of motherhood entirely, as the decline in birth rates over the past four decades demonstrates. But Japan's low birth rates could also be seen as an indication of the power of the myth of motherhood and how it continues to wield a power over um, discourses of motherhood. The three-year myth, um, and that's the myth that mothers should stay at home with their children for at least the first three years of the child's life, that continues to be prevalent. And two-thirds of married women say that they believe mothers should not work when their child is young. Research into reasons why some Japanese women do not have children found that half of unmarried women in their 30s believe that child rearing is a great psychological strain. So convinced that motherhood is an incredibly consuming endeavour in terms of time, effort, as well as resources, some women may decide not to do it at all. So just to bring it sort of further up to date, so during the 1990s and 2000s, sociologists working on family and motherhood in Japan revealed that full-time mothers confined to the home complain of loneliness and isolation, and it was blamed for a rise in alcoholism among housewives and youth delinquency, as well as domestic violence. And reports of child neglect and abuse are another sign that not all women's experiences of motherhood are rosy and that love for one's child should not be presumed. Of course, some cases are in um, such cases are in the minority and, and the causes are multiple and complex, but can include stress due to financial difficulties and the burden of juggling work and child rearing. And um, research suggests that such cases are higher, more common in working class single mother families. As I mentioned earlier, when extreme cases are reported in the media, they're often sensationalized. The mother may be demonized, quite literally being labeled demon mothers or described as having lost their so-called natural maternal instinct. Sometimes the crimes are linked to the mother's apparent sexual behavior and she's portrayed as deviant. So the underlying assumption is that a good mother does not have sexual desire, which goes back to a size um, you know, theory of the maternal fantasy as, you know, the as asexual mother. And the reporting is rarely nuanced. Little is said about the circumstances of the family or, or the father's role. Often the father is completely absent from the, the media discourse. 
Yeah, if I could just pick up on that. If there's so much pressure on mothers, why is there not a similar pressure on how fathers should be? Well, I mean, it goes back to this idea that mothers are the ones who should stay at home and look after the children. Um, so, you know, I mean, this is not obviously, this is clearly not limited to Japan. I think we have this similar idea. And, you know, and in practice, mothers tend to be the ones who do most of the child rearing. So it's kind of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy that we tell mothers that they should stay at home and raise children. So that's what they do. And then the way they raise their children impacts on the child and it will have an influence on the way the child, the child develops. And so we say we use that as a reason to justify why women should stay at home and raise children. So it, it's kind of a, a vicious circle, as it were. But yes, in Japan in particular, I think we're going to talk about men now, I guess. But before we sort of really talk about men in particular, what I'd like to do is sort of just qualify when I talk about this idealization of motherhood. I want to make it clear that it's not just men who um, have this fantasy of motherhood. Women also desire to be full-time housewives. Um, and well, some women do desire to be full-time housewives, um, but the proportion that do has decreased significantly from about 30% 30 years ago to about 18% today. And only, But only 7% of women actually believe they will actually achieve this desire. So in the right conditions, many women find motherhood to be an extremely rewarding experience, but the conditions have to allow it. And most women want more from life than just to be mothers. So I think in Japan, most women still um, see mothering in their future. They still want to be mothers, but they also want more. And there are also going to always going to be women who never want to be mothers, regardless of their circumstances, whether whether it's to do with financial or practical reasons or they just don't desire to have children and be mothers and that also needs to be recognized and respected however the notion of the heterosexual two-parent family based on the male breadwinner and female homemaker became the basis on which post-war Japanese society was founded and I think that goes back to your question about why men ever really have the same pressures on them it's because they have a different type of pressure which is to support the family to go out and work and earn money and support the family in that way and so the welfare system labor market and working conditions were based on the unpaid labor of women in the home because someone needed to be at home looking after the home and the children and also elderly relatives so that men could go out and work and devote themselves to the company. So to the extent that men dominated and continued to dominate governance and policy making in Japan, they were the architects of the system. So that's why I often talk about this as a patriarchal discourse or patriarchal fantasy. And many of the idealized cultural representations of motherhood in literature, film and television from the post-war era were created by men too. But as Japan entered a period of economic decline and stagnation from the 1990s onwards, there was a crisis in masculinity as increasing numbers of men were shut out of the salaryman life course of lifetime employment with company benefits. And many became trapped in non-regular employment and saw their prospects of marriage and family decline as a result. And this precipitated a backlash from conservative voices in the academic, media and political world against policies promoting gender equality and other progressive policies that they saw as a threat to the so-called traditional family, which, by the way, is not traditional in the sense that it's, you know, dates back to you know historic times but really it, it's a it's a modern phenomenon but it's often described as you know the traditional family of the the two parent salary man husband and the, the stay-at-home wife 
So while women have generally taken a pragmatic response towards the social changes Japan has experienced over the past few decades, for example, no longer aspiring to marry a highly educated man with a large salary, but instead looking for a partner that will share the domestic burdens while they both work, heterosexual men continue to express a desire for a wife who will conform to conventional notions of fem femininity, women who will be nurturing and take care of their needs. But of course, just as women have demanded that they be seen as more than wives and mothers, men are also redefining masculinity beyond the stereotype of the breadwinning heterosexual salary man who devotes himself to the company. And some are embracing a softer masculinity that is not dependent on professional success and marriage. For example, there's the, the so-called herbivore men phenomenon. If I don't, I don't know if you've, you've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, danshi, I think is the, is the term. Soshoku, sometimes they add the kei danshi, yeah. Okay, Soshoku yeah. danshi or soshoku mm. kei danshi. Um, yeah, so herbivore men. And um, so men are now showing more interest in what were once thought to be feminine concerns, such as fashion and appearance. And... Perhaps then they seem to be not as proactive in, in finding a partner. However, the institutions in Japan, including the political and administrative organs and the mainstream media, remain conservative. And the discourse of the herbivore man, for example, which was initially portrayed as a positive development, began to take on negative connotations um, as it was attacked by traditionalists who saw it as a threat to the Japanese economy and the Japanese family, that it was going to be another thing that held Japan back and would perpetuate the demographic crisis. Because if men were not marrying and having families, then that would be the end of, of Japan as we know it. So men also are equally constrained by heteronormative notions of gender, I would say. Mm. I just find it interesting how there isn't the same expectations on them to uh, participate in child rearing in the traditional dynamic, as you as you refer. I'm I'm curious about um, your experience, or so if you don't mind me, like going into an anecdotal experiences uh, as as being a mother in Japan. Um, when you're attending these classes on motherhood in Japan, uh, I'm sure you are with other expecting mothers, and do you find that they conformed to this notion or they were happy to take on this idea of the a selfless mother as you refer to obviously you don't have these discussions about you know these theoretical discussions sure, about sure. motherhood and philosophies of parenting but obviously i think what i found in my experience of motherhood in japan and and, and to be fair before that experience i did not have an experience anywhere else so I, I had obviously impressions of what motherhood was like in the UK where I, I grew up and I, you know, I lived most of my life before going to Japan. Um, so I had an idea of discourses about motherhood, public discourses in the UK, but I didn't have any personal experience. And it's not like I was, you know, extremely interested in motherhood before I became a mother, to be honest with you. So... I, I think what I found in Japan was that, and you know, this this may be a feature of Japanese society and culture that, on on the one hand, Japan, you know, the discourse there's this idea of a bosei honno, which is like which means maternal. In, I guess it translates as maternal instinct, like it's something natural that we instinctively, when women become mothers, they instinctively love their child and they want to do everything for their child and also that they know what, what's best for their child. But then at the same time, you have all these classes and a lot of information and instruction. One thing about pregnancy, prenatal care in Japan, is that you're recommended to go for monthly appointments, which in the UK would be quite rare, especially in the NHS. A pregnant woman wouldn't be going every month mm. to prenatal checkups. But in Japan, it, you know, you, I felt you were constantly being monitored you were being told things like diet and stuff. There was a lot of information about diet. There was information about things you could and couldn't do. Um, lots of literature in terms of, um, you know, um, mat uh, maternity magazines, parenting magazines. 
So I found that quite interesting that on the one hand, there is this discourse of maternal instinct, like it's all supposed to come naturally to you and you're supposed to know what to do. But then there's all this literature that is, is giving you and telling you what, what, what you should be doing. So there was a little bit of a dissonance there, right, between, mm. you know, um, on the one hand, you're supposed to know, but then there's lots of this, lots of information for you to consume so that you know, <laughs> telling you what you should be doing. I found that, I think I found that that quite interesting. And I wasn't sure if, I mean, obviously you could take it or leave it. I mean, I think the, mo- the monthly checkups was something that was quite expected of women that obviously if you wanted to have a healthy pregnancy uh, and in Japan, generally there's a tendency towards natural childbirth. And when I say natural, I know that's also a contested term, but it's um, without drugs. So without an epidural, you know, you don't get pain relief. Uh, You can do, but generally the medical establishment in Japan is of the view that this would affect the process. It would delay the process and it wouldn't be good for the baby if if you have pain relief during your um, labor so generally it's discouraged and um, certainly the hospital I went to did not offer that it seems to me that there's a lot of external interest in your pregnancy which you wouldn't perhaps expect so much in the UK is that right I think there's a more of a hands-on approach yeah whereas in the UK and part of it it's to do with the obviously the the resources I think of the NHS as well but um, I mean, the other thing is also you have the baby he- here and as long as everything is it seems to have gone OK, as long as there's no complications and usually you leave hospital the next day in Japan, generally women, even if it's an uncomplicated a childbirth, the mother would stay for a week in, mm. in hospital. And then if, if it's something more complicated, like she's had a cesarean, then it would be a month at least that you know when i was there that was that was generally what happened also during that week it's um you you're sort of allowed to rest have a rest in a way while a lot of the care of the baby is is being done by the nurses so you you get a chance to rest but also that i think that's another opportunity for you to learn for you for them to teach you to make sure that the breastfeeding for example cuz Japan is also a nation that is very pro breastfeeding like the UK is. So I think that, again, there is that sort of support in a way. And there's sort of a bit of the the sense that these are things you learn, not things that just happen. Yeah. So I found that there is this dissonance between the discourse of this maternal instinct and women have this natural mis- maternal instinct and then, you know, women who perhaps act contrary to that, to what is the idealised expectation of motherhood, they often say, you know, there's this phrase, you know, haoya shikaku, you're a failed mother or um, so shitsu, loss of bose honno no so shitsu, like, you know, there's a loss of maternal instinct and there was a lot of concern when you had these cases in the media reports of women who had committed crimes or abused their children or 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 what have you that they had somehow lost their maternal instinct and a general concern that women in general were losing their maternal instinct in japan and i would say a lot of that was perhaps to do with the circumstances in reality most mothers are not living up to this not even aiming to aspiring to this very high standard of motherhood but if the circumstances allow it if you're if you're able to stay at home and look after your child or at least work part-time but you're able to spend time with your children and give them what they need uh, while also you know having time for yourself and um being financially stable then you know you have a much better chance of of having a successful experience as a mother but obviously, you know, if you're, say you're a single parent you and, you know, um, Japan does not um, have, a, you know, a, an adequate welfare system to, to support people on low incomes or single parents, um, many of whom are on low incomes, um, especially single mothers, um, you know, they're often working in irregular employment, um, on low wages, they're bringing up a family, they Yes, there are some. There is some welfare, but not much to support them. And they're often more than eighty percent of single mothers are working. 
Childcare is, you know, especially in the cities, childcare can be expensive and it can be very difficult to access. And then these women also are expected to support their children's education and give them psychological, emotional support. But there's so many pressures on them that it's not surprising that some mothers do get stressed and occasionally, very rarely, some mothers take it out on their children. Mm, yeah, so it's definitely a lot of pressures in Japanese society on mothers, any way you slice it. I've got one last question for you, Vorum. So has your research given you any insights into the role of nostalgia in public discourse outside of Japan? There's certainly a lot of emotional appeal to it, but is there an unproblematic way of indulging in fantasies of the past in this way? Oh, I mean, absolutely. Nostalgia is a global phenomenon and um, cultural expressions of nostalgia in the form of film, television, music have really exploded, I'd say, in recent years. Um, and you could just think of like popular TV programs from, you know, recent years like, you know, Mad Men, The, Mis the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Stranger Things. Um, or bands, music bands that have reunited after years adrift, or, you know, retro mm. fashion, the popularity of activities such as knitting and crochet, which boomed during the coronavirus pandemic as well. Mm. The cinema's full of remakes at the moment too. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's just, you can't move for it. Um, and much of this nostalgic consumption, as scholars refer to it, um, it, could be considered playful, looking at past cultural styles and practices in a fun or ironic way. Um, but other types of nostalgia have a political edge. On the one hand, indulging in nostalgic consumption could be seen as a desire to escape from our anxieties about our present and future, which at the moment is very far from certain. We certainly have a lot of anxiety about what's going on right now and where, you know, how things are going to develop. Um, but as I've, I've already said, um, nostalgic expression also offers the potential for criticism, both of the past and the present situation. Um, and in fact, scholars divide nostalgia into different categories. Um, you have re reluctant nostalgia, which is melancholic. It focuses on what's been lost. But there is also progressive nostalgia, um, or what scholars have, to have termed progressive nostalgia, which is productive and reflective, and it brings past and present into dialogue. So, for example, if we take the nationalist discourse surrounding Brexit, there was much talk of bringing back you know, blue passports or mm. um, Britain taking back control of its waters or strengthening links with the Commonwealth over the relationship with Europe and underlying much of this discourse. Uh, well, it was a discourse of restoring the nation to its former glory, of returning to the good old days. Or restoring empire. Ex well, that's what, I'm, what I was about to go on to say mm. is that what's not expressed explicitly, but obviously when you, you talk about things like the Commonwealth and and this and that. Um, what's very much implied is that this former glory that's being invoked so wistfully is based on Britain's status as an imperial power. Of course, this nationalist Brexit discourse wanted to bask in the glory and status the nation once enjoyed without addressing the darker parts of that imperial history. <laughs> Um, yeah, those of us that were victims of British imperialism or the children or grandchildren of those victims that have a different perspective on those so-called good old days. And like, for example, the recent Windrush scandal, it, that not only reminds us of this complicated history, but also demonstrates that its impact and its relevance continues to this day. And, you know, people are still suffering because of that. Um, and let's also not forget that historical revisionism is also an ongoing issue in Japan too. But in, in higher education, there's this movement to decolonize the curriculum, which has gathered pace over the last decade or so, and even longer. And that's not about erasing history. It's about recognizing that history written and told from only one perspective ignores the complexity of the human experience. Um, when, for example, the BLM movement was bringing down statues last year, again, it wasn't about erasing history, but about introducing nuance, reframing the narrative in a way that takes into account diverse experiences and nostalgia that is reflective and acknowledges that the way we see the past has changed, 
and is changing can contribute to our understanding of history in a more nuanced way. Really fascinating stuff. Well, thank you for answering all of my questions for them. Before we finish the episode, could you share with us what other projects you're currently working on? Sure. Um, so the pandemic that happened not long after um, I finished my PhD, and that gave me a chance to reset and look beyond my research into motherhood. So during that this time, I've been co-editing a handbook with Griselda Kirsch, who was my, my former supervisor at SOAS, on Japanese media and popular culture in transition. And I authored a book chapter on interactions between media and the feminist movement in Japan, and also another chapter on representations of sex, gender and disability in Japanese visual media. And all of these um, are due to be published in 2022. Um, and my research into cultural representations of motherhood is continuing here at Cardiff. I'm particularly interested in women's writings on motherhood and how they are adapted for the screen. Excellent. I'll slow forward to you then. Thank you for joining me today, Forum. It's been a real pleasure. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. You can find a link to Forum's research profile in the description below. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Christopher Harding, Senior Lecturer in Asian History at the University of Edinburgh, to discuss Japanese as other. Drawing on his career as a cultural historian and his experience presenting a number of BBC productions on Japan, I asked Chris about how Japanese people have been othered, presented as something wholly different from other societies, and how he reconciles with that as someone long accustomed to Japanese culture. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you for listening.